The NASA SpaceX Crew-5 astronauts arrived at the International Space Station on October 6, beginning a six-month stay aboard the orbiting outpost. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket carrying four astronauts to the space station lifted off from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida on October 5. As its name suggests, Crew-5 is SpaceX's fifth operational crewed mission to the International Space Station under NASA's commercial crew contract. The Falcon 9 booster, making its first flight, landed on a drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean nine and a half minutes after liftoff, while the Crew Dragon spacecraft Endurance, carrying the astronauts, separated from the upper stage 12 minutes after liftoff. Endurance carried NASA astronauts Nicole Mann and Josh Kasada, Japanese space flyer Koichi Wakata, and Russian cosmonaut Anna Kakina to the space station on Wednesday. All were making their first flight to space, except for Wakata who had previously flown four times to space and had spent 347 days on the space station. Following a 29-hour flight, Crew Dragon Endurance arrived at the International Space Station on Thursday, October 6. The spacecraft made contact with the forward port of the station's Harmony module at 9 p.m. UTC while flying 415 kilometers above the west coast of Africa. The hatches between Endurance and the space station opened around 10.45 p.m. UTC and the crew five astronauts joined the station's existing crew of seven. During their six-month stay aboard the space station, the crew five astronauts will conduct scientific research in areas such as cardiovascular health, bioprinting, and fluid behavior in microgravity. Hours after the Crew-5 launch on October 5, another Falcon 9 rocket was launched from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, carrying 52 Starlink satellites into orbit. SpaceX was scheduled to launch Intelsat's Galaxy 33 and Galaxy 34 satellites on October 6 from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. However, a Falcon 9 auto aboard at T-30 seconds after the onboard computer detected a tiny helium leak ended the count for the day. SpaceX uses helium gas to keep the Falcon 9 propellant tanks under pressure as they're drained during the ascent. The next Galaxy satellite's launch opportunity is October 7 at 11.06 p.m. UTC. It might have happened by the time you watch this video. Nearly a decade after it was launched, India's maiden mission to Mars reportedly ran out of fuel, making it difficult to revive in the red planet's orbit. The Mars Orbiter mission, or MOM, was launched aboard a polar satellite launch vehicle in November 2013, and it entered the Red Planet's orbit in September 2014. The spacecraft was part of a demonstration mission to prove that India could design, launch, and operate a mission on another planet. The mission's success made India the first Asian nation to reach the Martian orbit and the first nation in the world to do so on its maiden attempt. It was one of the most cost-effective interplanetary missions ever devised, costing just around $74 million in 2013. The Mars Orbiter was designed to last six months, but far exceeded the expected lifespan by several times. It was equipped with five instruments to study the Martian surface features, morphology, mineralogy, and the Martian atmosphere. Over the years, the spacecraft studied the planet's dust storms, atmosphere, ice caps, and made many contributions to the scientific community. In the past, ISRO had been undertaking orbital maneuvers on the spacecraft to move it to a new orbit to avoid an impending solar eclipse. However, in April 2022, there were back-to-back -back eclipses, including one that lasted more than seven hours. According to ISRO officials, as the satellite battery is only designed to handle an eclipse duration of one hour and 40 minutes, the recent extended eclipses might have drained the battery beyond the safe limit. Moreover, the spacecraft propellant must have been exhausted during the orbital maneuvers in April, and hence the desired attitude for sustained power generation could not be attained. The space agency declared on October 3 that the spacecraft was non-recoverable and had attained its end of life. ISRO is planning to launch another mission to Mars in the coming years, which is also likely to be an orbiter. Spin Launch, a California-based startup developing a spinning arm capable of launching small satellites into near-Earth orbit, has completed its tenth successful test launch in less than 11 months. Spin Launch's suborbital accelerator system catapulted the company's flight vehicle for a brief suborbital flight from New Mexico on September 27. The vehicle carried six payloads, including four partner payloads and two instrumentation payloads from NASA, Airbus, Cornell University, and satellite developer Outpost. The customer payloads launched by the accelerator survived up to 10,000 Gs when the 33-meter-long rotating arm encased in a white shell spun and released the payload at 8,000 km per hour. The payloads were successfully recovered and removed from the flight test vehicle after completing the suborbital test flight. The tenth successful flight was an important milestone for spin launch, demonstrating that standard satellite components are inherently compatible with spin launch's launch environment. 
Please check out my previous video to learn about the spin launch technology and the launch vehicle in detail, link in the description. American private firm Firefly Aerospace's Alpha rocket successfully delivered a handful of tiny satellites to Earth orbit for the first time. The 29-meter-tall launch vehicle lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Base on October 1, kicking off a demonstration mission dubbed Alpha Flight 2 to the Black. About 2.5 minutes after liftoff, the rocket's two stages separated, and the upper stage was inserted into an elliptical transfer orbit. After a circularization burn, the upper stage deployed its seven CubeSats into a 300-kilometer low-Earth orbit, and Firefly declared 100% mission success. Firefly Alpha, the world's largest carbon fiber rocket ever built, is capable of sending a 1,170 kg payload into a low Earth orbit at a cost of $15 million per launch. The rocket's first stage is outfitted with four Reaver 1 engines that run on RP 1 and liquid oxygen propellants. The engines work together to produce a total thrust of 736.1 kN and a specific impulse of 296 seconds. Reaver utilizes the tap-off engine cycle, where pressure from the main combustion chamber is used to spin the engine turbine, instead of a separate gas generator. However, since the exhaust gas used to spin the turbine is still expelled, the tap-off cycle is considered an open cycle engine. The second stage of the Alpha rocket is equipped with a single Lightning 1 engine, which is also a tap-off engine cycle capable of delivering 70 kN of thrust. The October 1 mission was Alpha's second orbital launch attempt. During the first demonstration mission in September 2021, one of the rocket's four first-stage engines shut down prematurely, leading to the loss of the mission. The next Firefly Alpha mission, which will launch 11 CubeSats into orbit as part of NASA's Alana program, is set for November 29. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After undergoing more than two weeks of robustness upgrades, SpaceX rolled out Super Heavy Booster 7 from the build site to the launch site on Friday morning. While everyone expected SpaceX to install blast protection shields over the Raptor engines of the booster before rollout, they only installed a shiny foil-like shroud over the engines. I'm not sure why SpaceX decided to install these strange covers over the engines instead of strong metallic blast protection shields. Booster 7 and Starship 24 will be stacked atop the orbital launch mount in the coming days to begin full stack tests. Road closures are scheduled for Monday through Wednesday for possible Starship testing, and a notice to Mariners has already been issued. The tests will most likely begin with a series of cryoproof tests, before proceeding to full-stack static fire tests. If all goes as planned, the static fire test campaign will culminate in a full-stack 33-engine static fire. And if all ground tests go as planned without any major issues, and SpaceX gets a launch license from the FAA, the orbital flight test will most likely take place by the end of this year. Two Raptor engines were delivered to the Starbase launch site on Friday morning. SpaceX appears to have plans to replace two of Booster 7's engines before static fire tests begin. Super Heavy Booster 8, which was supposed to perform cryoproof tests before the Booster 7 Ship 24 full stack tests, is still waiting at the launch site. SpaceX seems to have suspended Booster 8 tests for some days. SpaceX teams at the launch site continue upgrading the orbital launch mount in preparation for the forthcoming 33-engine static fire test. Teams recently tested the structural integrity of the Super Heavy Booster hold-down clamps with the help of a crawler crane. The orbital launch mount employs 20 hold-down clamps to secure the booster to the launch pad and keep the vehicle in position during static fire tests. These clamps also had to have the strength to hold down the launch vehicle after ignition until all engines registered full thrust, then they automatically and simultaneously release the rocket for liftoff. The clamps do not have to overcome the full power of all the engines because the weight of the fueled vehicle will counteract much of the thrust. SpaceX load tested the booster hold down clamps by inserting a metal plate into the clamps to mimic the booster and putting them under vertical load stress using the LR11000 crane. The load test will ensure that the hold-down clamps can secure the booster to the launch pad during the upcoming full-stack 33-engine static fire test. A booster hold-down clamp retraction test was conducted on Thursday to ensure that the mechanism is working as expected. The supply of liquid methane and liquid oxygen to Starbase has increased significantly in recent days. SpaceX requires tons of cryogenic propellants to feed all 33 engines of Booster 7 during the static fire test. At the build site, teams moved the nose cone of Starship 26 into the high bay on October 1. It was stacked atop the payload bay section of Ship 26 three days later. Note that the nose cone does not have flaps installed, which usually happens before stacking operations. 
The current theory is that Ship 26 and 27 will not feature flaps or thermal protection tiles. It takes a lot of time to carefully install thousands of thermal protection tiles on ships. As a result, the construction of reusable ships that features TPS tiles takes much more time compared to expendable ships without thermal insulation. Furthermore, expendable ships do not require the installation of flaps as they are not meant for controlled atmospheric re-entry and landing. In this way, SpaceX can accelerate the production of flight-ready ships and speed up the testing of the critical systems during launch. I think once they are confident that the starships can be launched into orbit flawlessly, SpaceX will focus on atmospheric re-entry and catching ships with the tower arms. Moreover, Ship 26 will not carry any Starlink satellites into orbit during its orbital test flight. However, Ship 27 might deploy Starlink satellites into orbit. Ship 28's nose cone, which is now inside one of the production tents, has recently begun to receive its thermal protection tiles. Furthermore, the payload bay section of Ship 28 has TPS attachment pins installed on it, and the forward flaps of Ship 28 already have TPS tiles installed on them. So it appears that, beginning with Ship 28, SpaceX will attempt to capture starships using tower arms. Elon Musk recently tweeted that Tesla Cybertruck will be able to serve as a boat for short periods to cross rivers and seas that aren't too choppy. According to him, the waterproof functionality of the Cybertruck will allow it to travel from Starbase to South Padre Island, which involves crossing a shipping channel approximately 477 meters wide. This will save a significant amount of time for those wishing to travel from South Padre Island to Starbase. A mini hovercraft was recently spotted at the Starbase build site. Maybe SpaceX is planning to test the hovercraft across the channel before giving Cybertrucks a try. Or perhaps the hovercraft is just for retrieving the Starship pieces from the wetlands if an anomaly occurs during liftoff. Work is underway on the Starship Orbital Launch Tower at Kennedy Space Center Pad 39A. On Friday morning, teams placed the water deluge system manifold around the base of the orbital launch mount. High-pressure water sprayed through injectors connected to the manifold will help protect the Starship from the extreme acoustic and thermal environment during ignition and liftoff. At the SpaceX Roberts Road facility, teams have begun prefabricating sections of the second launch tower at Kennedy. Parts of the tower sections were recently found en route to Kennedy Space Center, and several structural sections of the tower have been spotted outside SpaceX Hangar M at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Although we know that SpaceX plans to build a second Starship launch tower at Kennedy, the exact location of the tower is still unknown. During the recent SpaceX Crew 5 webcast, SpaceX Falcon production and engineering manager Jesse Anderson mentioned that the Starship human landing system will lift off from Pad 39A. Our progress with human space exploration does not stop there. As you can see, we've started construction on a new Starship pad at Kennedy Space Center, the same pad that will take NASA's human space lander system to the moon. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.